Right, this um, video is related to the synoptic aspect or, or the other unit information that you can incorporate and you need to incorporate in various aspects of Unit 6 uh, coaching. So this video is about um, Unit 3 information, Applied Psychology. Now this is stuff that I know that we have mentioned to some degree in lessons, maybe not always with the same information or same terminology but we're going to build on that and there's other stuff that you can incorporate as well i think the thing i like about the psychological aspects is this is stuff that you can relate to your participants in your planning in 6.2 in the, obviously the psychological aspects to several things there but also to yourself as the coach now all of you that have coached so far and those of you that haven't yet will undoubtedly feel elements of stress, anxiety, arousal, confidence issues, no, all the normal stuff. Um, when you do the review of 6.3, you can talk about this relating to you as the coach, but also about the experiences of your participants. So what might be the psychological responses that a performer may experience? How can you as a coach manage or moderate this? But also... How do you as a coach manage exposure to increasing psychological challenge and why? So how do you deal with yourself? This is just some of the topics that you might include in various places. So motivation factors, mindset, arousal levels, we've definitely talked about, stress, anxiety and evaluation, apprehension, confidence, group dynamics, because not all of you, but many of you had team group drills where your players had to work with each other and then psychological interventions so things that you can do or as a coach you can offer your participants to help cope with stresses or arousal levels um, or also things that you might do for yourself actually so again remember it applies to both right let's get started so motivation i think some of you will know aspects of this already so i definitely think you will have heard of um, extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. You did it in 6.1, you may have learnt it from school. How motivating are competitive situations or how unmotivating are isolated uh, practices? Um, maybe it's motivation, the success that comes from the simplicity of an isolated, you know, the mastery of an isolated practice. Um, things like rewards, so I don't know if some of you, certainly all of you gave, or many of you gave praise. That's a, an extrinsic reward. Feeling good. Um, did you offer any, can you or could you offer any um, opportunities as a coach for something positive to happen? I know some people mentioned punishment, but be careful with things like that. It can be really motivating if you set goals. So you may talk to your participants, you may have before your session, you may have at the start of the series, with what we want them to achieve in a drill you may say right this is your challenge can you do this that's motivating especially if it's realistic and achievable for them and if they get it what's their next goal and that um, that can be again very valuable as a strategy to motivate your participants what we want is them to be intrinsically motivated because that's where people will enjoy have fun love getting better if it's all about winning and being the best that can be problematic um, in terms of long-term motivation because people aren't going to be the best the whole time and that can be demoralizing if they're not careful. This motivational climate aspect of psychology is to do with what's the vibe in the space? Now you and the players and the location, the environment contribute to the climate, the motivational climate in your sessions. So if you as a coach really drive and really hard and are just all about winning that's the climate you create if you're all about who's the fastest who's the best who scores the most that's the vibe the climate you create that's what we call a competitive climate where people are really gonna you're teaching them to be concerned about being better than somebody else because that's what you care about and the opposite of that really is a, what we call a mastery climate is it just all about improving yourself based on you not really about comparison is it about development and improvement and, and getting things right and learning and enjoying for its own sake so that's very much a mastery climate what climate did you create in your sessions what climate should you create in your sessions did it get out of hand and therefore you know maybe it was a bit more to do with this again this can come in 
um, your 6.2 practices section or your uh, adaptations possibly or certainly in your 6.3 about your session and in your reflection what what would you be more aware of in the future achievement goal theory is more to do with the players I guess rather than the, the, the space you create so this raises the question are your players task or outcome orientated are they about achieving the task working well together success mastery or are they about winning performance being the best so are they about um, learning or improving your that's what it's you can see that these two are quite similar. This is to do with what you create as the coach and your players create, but this is more to do, I guess, a little bit more personality to do with what are your players like. Now, did you in your class, in your in your your coaching session, have players who were very outcome orientated? Did that affect things? Were there other players who were not like that, not so competitive? How do you manage that as the coach? Um, how do you moderate some of that? How do you encourage some of that? Because it's okay to be competitive. It's just the way you're competitive. Were there any players who didn't want to do something because they were trying to avoid failing at it, avoid missing it, avoid being bad at it? Were there players who never wanted to shoot because they were frightened of missing? This is called need to avoid failure, NAF. And those people can sometimes be the um, outcome -orientated, orientated people. They are worried about the judgment that comes from missing or being embarrassed or not being the best versus what we would call need to achieve approach. So people who strive to work hard, to do their best, to you know rise to the challenge, even if it's ch difficult, they're not worried, they try harder. Um, that's need to achieve so are your players natch or naff if you've got any naff people people who are lacking confidence the willingness to have a go how as a coach would you deal with that and think of you know the situations you set up the practices you set up or the way you might talk to them or what you might offer them how can you try and gradually change that now mindset is um, a relatively recent area of study um, the last you know few years really and, that, and although it feels similar to what I've just been talking about to Natch and Naf, your this approach that people have if somebody um, and this could apply to you as a coach actually if somebody is really open to the fact that even if they're not brilliant right now they can modify things change things improve things work on things and ultimately maybe gradually make check, make improvements that's what we call a growth mindset it's a process of learning it might involve you not being the best it might involve you failing but you crack on and try again and you try developing something else you any constructive feedback you get you take you build on you use that's a positive thing if things difficult that's okay you carry on this is the growth mindset um, athlete this is the growth mindset person it could be the growth mindset coach so some of you might have messed up on certain things or not felt confident or not really known your stuff that well if your growth mindset in future you will build on this and improve if you're fixed to mindsets you're the oh my god I'm never going to be any good at it oh my god I, you know this is where I'm at it's it's unchangeable it's fixed if I get told something wasn't great I'm ruined by it um, I don't see any opportunity to change it. I'm limited. I'm never going to be any good. You get frustrated and you give up. Okay. So what you want is your players to have growth mindsets, your athletes to have growth mindsets, and you as a coach, we want to have a growth mindset. So can you discuss any relevance of that in terms of, again, how you spoke to people? Did you see progress? What really nurtures this sort of belief in yourself as a coach or in your players? We want to develop resilience, that that um, ability to not do something well, make a mistake, and then try again, and then try again, and then try again, and to manage the emotions of it. And that's what resilience is all about, that repeatedly 
getting up again get you know you fall down you get up you fall down you get up um, and people and players and coaches need resilience now arousal theories or the effect of arousal on performance because it is related so it's an arousal performance relationship is something that I've talked about very much um, I'm going to talk very briefly about four theories of arousal um, and it is brief the first theory of arousal is drive theory what this suggests is that the more aroused you become the better you perform or the more likely you are to perform your dominant response now your dominant response is the one you're most automatically going to play a skill or response a behavior that you're most automatically going to do so for autonomous performers the more aroused they get in theory they will play better and they will um, re they will execute the skills or the tactics brilliantly if you're a beginner though the more aroused you get the more likely you're to perform your habitual response now as a beginner your habitual you don't have a correct habit yet you're learning you're changing your skill you're developing your skill so it could well be that your current habitual response is the wrong one or a bad technical one or the wrong shot so we might argue that this drive theory might be because it's suggestive might be true for experienced better ability players and not so true for cognitive performers so arousal level doesn't just mean you perform brilliantly it could mean you perform the wrong shot brilliantly <laughs> in a way so that kind of has its limitations as a theory so then we move on to this inverted u hypothesis because it looks like a, an upside down u and what this suggests is where you have low levels of arousal so arousal just to remind you is physiological and psychological readiness so where you have low levels of arousal you don't perform brilliantly and this might equate to being unmotivated lethargic can't be bothered you know like coming to a session it's an 8 30 session and you're not really in the mood for it you might have low levels of arousal and it could be that you don't play brilliantly because of that what this theory suggests then if you've got really high levels of arousal that you also don't play brilliantly it's too much what it suggests is as arousal, arousal increases you will get to a point where performance is getting better performance is getting better at this point here this is moderate levels of arousal and this is where you play your best now everybody's optimal level of arousal moderate level of arousal will be different but it basically says is you don't want to be under aroused you don't want to be over aroused you want to be moderately aroused to perform your best in situations now you can liken this to the different types of practices you know competitive practice will probably heighten arousal heighten arousal and that's where we can find that things go wrong so this theory suggests that low arousal makes you perform poorly if you gradually increase arousal you get to the point where you play your best but if you go beyond that point you gradually get worse and gradually is the key to this theory is that true of us possibly possibly not this could be you as a coach of course as well H high arousal perform well maybe maybe not then we have this theory so this these two graphs are called or catastrophe theory because the problem with inverted u is that once you get highly aroused do you just gradually get worse or sometimes have you experienced catastrophic drop in performance now what this theory also does is it incorporates specifically what your head is doing your cognitive anxiety anxiety is worry or apprehension or nervous negative nervousness so what it says is if you've got low cognitive anxiety if you're not particularly stressed out mentally as your physiological your physical arousal goes up you'll kind of follow inverted u a bit like this but if you are very highly stressed worried negatively worried negatively stressed distressed anxious about your performance or what's going on 
it follows inverted U to the point where you get highly physiologically aroused. So if you have high cognitive and high physiological arousal, you get this catastrophic drop in performance. If arousal continues to go, then it will increasingly worsen again. So at this point, you get a catastrophic drop and then it will gradually carry on getting worse. So the point being, if your physiologically heart rate's going, you know, before, you know, if you're doing competitive practice, competitive situation, you're physiologically pumped, but also you're freaking out in your head, that's when we might have problems. And we've talked about this in terms of competitive performance, uh, sorry, cognitive performance, but it could also be elite performance as well. Compared to this, so if we can control our heads quite a lot, we don't might not have this catastrophe. The final theory is called ISOF, um, individual zone of functionality or functioning. And what this implies is you may have low, moderate, or high level sort of anxiety. And depending on what you're like, your place where you're in the zone, where you play your best, could be low, medium, high. So have a look here. So athlete A is performs their best, or you've all heard of the phrase of being in the zone, you know, where you can't do anything wrong. It's just flowing naturally, not, not worried about anything. You're just performing and skills are working and it's great. So athlete A happens to perform their best when they experience low levels of anxiety. If they were to become more anxious, they go out of their zone and they won't perform as well. So we know that the parameters of anxiety for this performer to play their best are this zone. Note it's a zone, it's not one particular point, it's a zone. So this lower levels of anxiety work okay for athlete A. Athlete B, their zone of, you know, playing really well is when they have moderate levels of anxiety so what that means is this person kind of gets gets on with a level of anxiety a little bit of worry a little bit of oh my gosh I feel a bit nervous and they perform their best with moderate levels below that or above that they don't play well and obviously athletes see their place to be is they thrive on anxiety they need that edge to perform their best now this is all to this is very much to do with personality because different players will be a b or c different players you might have a group of five six people in your coaching session three of them might be here two of them might be there one of them might be there and how do you, so a coach knowing what their players are like enables them to help manage getting in this place if you put this person in a stressful position that will be bad and so on Okay, so arousal theory um, can relate to performance, but also is very much related to anxiety levels and individual personalities. Some people are inherently anxious. It's part of their personality. They're anxious about everything, work, home, play, social life. Some people are not like that. Some people have anxiety in the moment. We call that state anxiety. But some people have trait anxiety their personality is fairly consistently anxious before we move on um, if I can use inverted U as the example inverted U also talks about attention field now when you're under aroused here what that means is you're not particularly focused you might daydream you might be distracted easily that's a very wide attention field you get distracted by what's going on around you you're looking around maybe when you're overly aroused here, we get what we call very narrow attention field. So you just get panicked and you can only focus on one thing. And if you're only focusing on one thing in a sport like netball, what you're missing is what the other things that are going on around you. And you might miss opportunities. You might make bad decisions. When you're in this optimal levels of arousal, we have the sort of ideal attention field where you can attend to select the appropriate cues 
So the people calling who are free, you weigh up all the information here, you make the right choices. You don't get distraction. You don't freak out like up here. You don't go blind panic, we call it up here. And you're not distracted like you might be down here. So this is the ideal width of attention, the ideal um, level of arousal for you to respond to all the cues and the information that's in your environment. Okay, so I just mentioned anxiety um, already. and we, I mentioned straight, uh, state and trait anxiety. So traits, traits are the things that make up your personality. You might have a very competitive trait that's part of your personality doesn't tend to change you're always quite a competitive person you might be quite an anxious person in life that's a trait it's part of your personality it doesn't tend to change state means in the moment so i might have low trait anxiety but put me in a sport competitive situation and i get really nervous in that moment okay so that's state Importantly, what you do, so as athletes, as players, what you do with anxiety or a situation really matters. So if you're put in a position where let's say you're gonna play competitively or you've got to shoot, this is the demand. The demand is you've got to shoot. In this example, they've given a penalty, right? How you perceive that situation is the make or break. Um, so this again, very much can relate to you as a coach you've got to coach for your assessment. If you perceive that as a t totally threatening trauma, negative perception, probably you'll get more and more distressed. You'll worry about it. And the implication of this is that that might make you perform worse as a coach. You might forget things, you might get confused, you might panic, you might not do what you planned. If you can perceive it as a really great opportunity, something that you're going to give your best go to, even if it's not perfect, it's okay. So you kind of put a positive swing on things. We call that you stress. You'll still be nervous, but you perceive it as like an energizing, positive thing. You know, having a bit of nerves is quite helpful and might help get you in the zone, maybe. So in terms of stress, how you perceive that stress is to do with, am I gonna be able to cope? No, my God, I'm gonna be awful, panic, threat. You're worried that you're not gonna be able to do it really well. You're not, you're not gonna coach a good session. It turns into a negative stress, distress, which will affect your arousal levels badly. Let's pop back to here. You'll go over the top, you'll go too far, too far, negative. Or can you perceive it as a positive thing? which means that you'll have this positive stress, this positive arousal, which hopefully places you in the optimal level or in the zone. Perception, how you, how you view something can affect how it goes for you. Um, don't wanna to get too lost on this, but especially as coaches, but even as players, you may have experienced cognitive or somatic anxiety. Cognitive, so somatic anxiety is the physical stuff. Butterflies, feel a bit sweaty, hearts racing, uh, you know, the physical aspects. Cognitive anxiety is the worry related to that. So if I'm aware my heart rate is pounding, I think that's a bad negative thing. If I'm aware my palms are sweaty, I see that as a bad thing. And you can do stuff about it. So you can recognize these symptoms and you can try to mediate that. Breathing techniques are really powerful at changing this physiology and physically calming you. If you're physically calmer, probably you're cognitively calmer too. I think I'm just going to do this one last thing, competitive anxiety. So as players, as a coach, you need to be aware of your players' feeling about competition some people thrive on competition, look forward to it, it's fun. They're not worried about winning or losing, they, it's, it's motivating for them. Some people get really anxious and it could be, what's the source of this? It could be they're worried about being the worst player on the team, could be they're worried about messing it up, could be that they just, they don't, you know, they feel threatened by the situation. So as a coach, you understanding your players feeling about 
uh, competition can perhaps help you mediate this anxiety. So we use, so there's two more little topics to do really. So we use this terminology, self-confidence a lot, self-esteem, self-confidence, um, how we feel about ourselves is self-esteem and how sure we are of ourselves. So self-assuredness is a more general personality trait. trait. So self-confidence tends to be more generic, more applied to broader situations. Self-efficacy is much more situation specific. So you might be a broadly confident person, but you might have low self-efficacy when it comes to coaching or playing netball as a participant. So they, they are slightly different. So if you think about self-efficacy as a situation specific confidence, it's how we perceive our ability, how we think we can do in a particular situation. And we base that on any past experiences we may have had. So if you were coaching again next week and you felt really, if your session went badly this week and you're coaching again next week, your self-efficacy might be really low because of this experience. Or it could shoot up because you did a really good coaching session so next week you'll feel stable and if I did a good one this week and I did a bad one next week it might go down again so that it is much more changeable it's much more based on what has happened confidence is affected by that but it tends to be a bit more consistent okay now here there's some blurb that you can have a look at um, so your confidence and your efficacy is influenced by these sorts of things it's influenced by, so as players, um, a coach can influence the player's efficacy in a session by verbal persuasion, persuading them that they're all right. So a lot of you are very good at encouraging and motivating and saying positive things about your participants. That's called verbal persuasion. You are contributing, hopefully, to your players becoming or having higher self-efficacy. They may have started off not blaming in themselves, and if you can encourage them verbally, then you could persuade them to have slightly higher efficacy. For you as a coach, you might influence your own self-efficacy as a coach by imagining yourself being good. And you can tell this to your, play your players as a strategy, visualization, imagery, picture themselves successfully playing the sport. That's a strategy to, to increase confidence and efficacy. As a coach, imagine yourself performing well as a coach. That's a way of influencing your efficacy and ultimately your confidence. These two are obviously linked to the two topics we've just talked about, anxiety and arousal. And you can do that verbally, you can do that physiologically. Um, what you want as a coach is to get your players up to their optimal level of arousal. You want to manage their anxiety. Similarly, you as a coach need to get yourself at your optimal level of arousal to perform as a coach as well as possible, not be too stressed or negatively worrying about how you are. Okay, so you can look at these sorts of things. Um, players, if they see each uh, see peers who are similar, similar age, similar standard, doing something well, modeling success they'll believe that they've got a good chance of being able to do it as well if you're the first to do a demonstration you freak out aren't you don't you so maybe selecting somebody in the group to demonstrate a skill or a, a practice shows the other players that they can do it and that will give them more efficacy okay so the stuff here you can talk about in terms of your players or yourself as a coach Group dynamics then. Group dynamics is how a group of people interact with each other. And I think the main things to incorporate here are the fact that many of your activities were team sports, requiring your players to interact. So we call that interactive um, sports or interactive teams. Ideally, we want teams or groups of people playing together in a sport to have high levels of cohesion. That's kind of how you interact together. Now there are two types of cohesion, task cohesion or social cohesion. Task cohesion is, 
do you interact well together to perform well together to get to achieve the task and it could be complete the practice or play well in a competition now you c and, and social cohesion is how well do you get on with each other now these don't have to both be present so you could have a, a functioning team that get on well that, to achieve a task together but don't necessarily love each other socially you could have a team that love each other are brilliant friends but don't p play well together and of course perhaps ideally you have a bit of both how do you as a coach influence this or this um, and your group practices or your competitive situations will be part of building this it's like uh, team building um, activities also leadership now it may be play um, some of your players are natural leaders and does that come out and manifest and show how do you use that as a coach if they're more experienced could they take on a leadership role we've talked about autonomous performers helping cognitive performers do you say right i'm going to pair you with so and so right can you for the next five minutes i want you to help do this work on these three coaching coaching points in this practice so give some of your players leadership roles that will really boost their esteem um, but you can also of course talk about you as a coach what leadership role did you take on were you very laissez-faire did you kind of kind of set them going and then let them crack on with it or were you democratic some of you said what do you want to do next do you want to do that again do you want to choose your own teams do you, what do you want to do or were you autocratic did you just tell what they you know state what they had to do next and i've seen actually all three of those in the coaching sessions i've experienced so far so think about yourself as a coach as a leadership style or think of your participants were any of them could any of them be leaders could you have in your review said actually i should have used so and so because they're quite experienced to help support the other person one aspect of group work is this process of building a team or building a group now i through your series of eight sessions what you might want to do is consider this Often when you put a group of people together they haven't played before, this is the first thing they do is we form the group. Um, people can feel quite up, they might not work brilliantly together, they're getting used to each other. This is the forming stage of team or group development. Then what can happen is we go into what we call the storming phase. As people kind of, uh, I suppose, get familiar with each other a bit more, they figure out who people are, they might be vying for the same position, they might be vying for who's the most dominant characters in the group. Um, this can be problematic in terms of the personal interactions while people figure out where they sit in this newly formed group. Then what happens is things normalise, they begin to figure out how it will work and productivity starts to become a bit better. They start feeling a bit better about things to the point where when they've been together a while, and you might recognize this in your own teams and your own sports, um, they start really thriving and performing well together and feeling happier about things and more positive again. So we kind of jolly along meeting new, new players in a team, don't work particularly well together, and then we go, oh, okay, this, oh, they want to be captain or they want to play centre forward or they want to do this. Well, I'm not sure I like that, blah, 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 blah. You know, you figure things out here, start to get it together a bit, normalise and then start thriving. So putting people together, players together within your coaching sessions, trying to build them as a group and trying to get them through these things could be something that you account for. Final thing um, is what you can do um, as a coach to support your players so we've talked about you know we talked about um, tactical or technical skill related coaching a lot what you can do to, to improve their performance practically but what a lot of coaches don't do is talk about psychological coaching how do you as a coach help them cope how do you help them thrive how do you help them manage themselves and their head because their head can you might have a brilliant performer who really suffers with anxiety and never plays brilliantly well in competition um, 
One thing would be goal setting. So setting goals to motivate them. You're going to measure them. You're going to use that. Strengths and weaknesses, goals. goals. And we've done already types of goals. Is it a process goal? Is it an outcome goal? Is it a mastery goal? Is it short term, long term? Okay. Um, it could be strategies like visualization. Remember, this can apply to you as a coach coping yourself or you as a coach providing interventions for your players to help them coach, teaching them to manage themselves. Um, so picturing yourself, uh, relaxation techniques, positive self-talk. If anything like me, I'm really good at slagging myself off and saying negative things in my own head. So coaching yourself as a coach, coaching your players to say positive things. If you make a mistake, oh, I tried really hard there. If you make a mistake, I'm going to get that better next time. Not, oh my God, I've ruined it. I'm so rubbish. And then arousal controlling techniques. Now, sometimes if your participants are under aroused and they're a bit apathetic, let's say they're not really getting into the session, we know that may, means they don't play well. So it could be as a coach, you whack some music on for the warm up, which is really energizing and boosts them and gets them higher to their optimal level of arousal. It could be that people are really nervous before a match and you teach them breathing control or positive statements. So these are sort of arousal lowering strategies. If somebody's gonna be taking a free throw in basketball, maybe you teach them to take three slow deep breaths beforehand and to visualize themselves scoring as a strategy to control that arousal level so that they don't freak out and mess up, okay, or gets them into the, the best zone for them. So these are things, again, you can apply to yourself or to your player, yourself as a coach or to your players.